Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. If you enjoy this program, come on over and join us at World of Warbirds Patreon. It's free to join. There's plenty of free stuff there, including all the images to accompany the episodes, so that you can see what I'm talking about. If you want to commit to the relationship, there are advantages to being a patron of the podcast, such as getting the episodes a week earlier and getting bonus episodes, and you'll have the satisfaction of helping contribute to the show. If you are presently listening to this through Patreon, well, thank you for your support. Now, on to today's show. Introduction Picture this. It is the 30th of October, 1935, and a series of very important flight tests are about to take place. At stake are not only two aircraft and their crews, but the economic well-being of the companies that built them, and even eventually the strength, prestige, and heck, even survival of the country that adopts them. The two aircraft are their company's answer to a U.S. Air Corps request that was looking for a bomber with the capability to reinforce the Air Forces in Hawaii, Panama, and Alaska. The Air Corps was seeking an undefined useful bomb load with endurance at 10,000 feet for 10 hours at a top speed of 200 to 250 miles per hour. A range of 2,000 miles was the goal. This bomber was to replace the Martin B-10. Although the B-10 had been a revolutionary machine and had basically reinvented and redefined what a modern bomber should be, in the fast-paced state of aviation design in the late 1930s, it was going to be obsolete real soon. Three main contenders for the new bomber emerged. Martin offered up an update to the B-10 called the Martin 146, but it wasn't enough of a leap forward to be seriously considered. On the other hand, the Douglas offering, which was called the B-18, looked really good. Its DNA came from Douglas's 14-passenger DC-2, which had been flying for the past year with such airlines as TWA, KLM, and Pan American, proving that air travel could be comfortable, safe, and reliable. The DC-2 was also the mother of another airplane that would go on to do great things, the DC-3. So the bloodline was there. The B-18 was an all-metal, mid-wing monoplane powered by two Wright R-1820 radial engines. It had an enclosed bomb bay, and for protection, it had manually operated nose, dorsal, and ventral gun turrets. There was a Boeing competitor, too. You could think of this aircraft as the offspring of a mating between Boeing's 247 airliner and its XB-15 experimental bomber. In this coupling, we even know which one was the mother and which one was the father, as the crews at the time actually referred to the XB-15 as a he, and it was later named Grandpappy. It was a four-engine giant with many revolutionary features such as an autopilot, de-icing equipment, and two installed gasoline generators to be used as auxiliary power units to provide power to the 110-volt electrical system. If repairs were needed in flight, the engines were actually accessible by using an access tunnel within the wing. Now that's handy. Crew comfort had also been thought of with the installation of a rest compartment with bunk beds, a galley, and a lavatory. The mom in this affair was the twin-engined Boeing 247 airliner, which had been built with reliable and comfortable airline travel in mind. It had good bones as well as touches including good cabin heating, air conditioning, and soundproofing. Boeing called the child of these two solid parents the 299. All right, let's get back to the 30th of October, 1935, for the all-important fly-off between these two aircraft, the Douglas B-18 and the Boeing 299. Pilots for the 299 were Major Ployer Peter Hill from Wright Field. He was the Material Division Chief of the Flying Branch. 
His co-pilot was Lieutenant Donald Putt, and Boeing Chief Test Pilot Leslie R. Tower was in the jump seat. There was also a mechanic and an observer on board, so all told a very solid crew. The 299 started up, ran up its engines, and took off. Very soon after, the plane stalled and spun into the ground and burned. Both pilots were killed. Due to such a tragic failure, the 299 was knocked out of the competition and the B-18 went on to get the contract and 350 of them were built. And it was known as the Bolo, which is the name of a knife from the Philippines, kind of like a machete. It was probably just as well. The twin-engined B-18 was much more affordable than the expensive four-engine Boeing failure of an aircraft. That was now consigned to the dustbin of history, never to be heard of again. Oh yeah, the other name for this overpriced, overpowered, loser, disaster of an aircraft was the XB-17. So I can hear you out there screaming at me, uh, asking if this is some sort of joke episode with an alternate timeline. But no, except for the dustbin of history part, this is basically what happened. I even considered going on then to continue the episode on the B-18 Bolo and not even touch the B-17. But I like to keep my listeners happy, and I do not want to encourage podcast mutiny. So, let's see how the B-17 managed to survive this, the first of its many, many metaphorical and physical battles. Design and Development The Model 299 had been designed by and built at Boeing's own expense, and really was the merging of the experimental XB-15 bomber and the 247 airliner. You could see the family resemblance in all three. The 299 was to be protected by five 30 caliber machine guns, and it could carry 4,800 pounds of bombs on the two racks in the enclosed bomb bay behind the cockpit. Power was provided by four Pratt & Whitney R1690 Hornet radial engines, with each producing 750 horsepower. Prototypes The B-17 first took to the air in July 1935 with Boeing's chief test pilot, Leslie Tower, at the controls. A reporter for the Seattle Times called it a 15-ton flying fortress, when he saw all the guns sticking out of the plane. It was typical newsman hyperbole, but Boeing kind of liked it and trademarked it. Its performance was great, achieving an average speed of 252 miles per hour, and if you remember, the top end of the speed goal was 250 miles per hour. Army leadership, such as the Chief of Staff, General Douglas MacArthur, and Brigadier General Frank Maxwell Andrews, head of the General Headquarters Air Force, liked the B-17. They liked the range, and the speed, and the fact that if one of its four engines failed, the aircraft could actually continue on its mission. The B-17 was clearly more in line with the Army's bomber doctrine. Uh, Then the 299 crashed. Firstly, let's get the cause of the crash out of the way. It had nothing to do with the aircraft itself. They had forgotten to take off the gust locks. And for those non-flying listeners, uh, these are locks either in the cockpit or also outside on the control surfaces that stop these control surfaces from bouncing around in the wind. They have to be removed before flight. In the case of the 299, it meant that the plane was uncontrollable and doomed from the moment it took off. Anyway, supposedly the accident with the B-17 helped bring about the use of checklists, but it still didn't help Boeing and the USAAC now that the airplane that they really wanted was now out of the competition. Well, in January 1936, they got creative and ordered 13 YB-17s. The Y in front meant that this aircraft was to be used for testing, Boeing now had a lifeline to keep producing the 17. 
Serial number NX13372 is considered to be the first actual flying fortress and Boeing took the opportunity to upgrade its design by installing more powerful Wright 182039 Cyclone engines. Later testing versions had exhaust-driven General Electric turbo superchargers installed, which boosted the performance to a speed of 311 miles per hour and a service ceiling of 38,000 feet. Gradually, the naysayers were shut up, and the orders were placed for small batches of non-testing, actual B-17s without the extra letters, you know, X or Y. In July 1940, 500 were ordered. By the time of Pearl Harbor, 200 were ready. The B-17 was ready for war, but just barely. Production and Variants It's remarkable that between 1937 and November 1941, only 155 B-17s were built. But once war broke out, the production of the bomber was supercharged, just like its engines. The Douglas and Vega companies were drafted to help build as many as possibly could be churned out. And when production ended in May 1945, a staggering 12,731 B-17s had been delivered. Not too shabby for an initial design failure, eh? Some of the birds that we look at barely changed during the course of the war, while others changed dramatically. If you remember the Lancaster, once the four Merlins are installed, that's pretty much the airplane that you have until the end. Yes, there was tinkering in new electronics and such, but not radical changes such as adding 10 extra feet of fuselage or making big changes to turret types or configurations. Not the B-17. The later ones look like a different species altogether from the earlier ones. Now let's take a close look at this evolution. The 299 was the prototype that crashed. The YB-17 was the 13 examples that were built for testing to keep the program alive. The YB-17A was the first one with turbo superchargers. The B-17B had an enlarged rudder and bigger flaps, and they built 39 of those. The C had the three bulged gun blisters changed to two flush oval-shaped gun window openings and a bathtub or bolo-type gondola gun position was added to the belly. 38 of those were built. 42 Ds were built, and I'm a little embarrassed to admit I'm not quite sure what's the difference between the C's and the D's. Maybe someone out there can enlighten me. Although I'm sure they looked impressive at the time, and the reporter did say that it looked like a flying fortress, all the versions of the 17 up until this point look a little dainty and fragile. Now the E variant looks like the aircraft has hit the gym seriously and is on the juice. The E looks like a whole new and wholly aggressive bird with a case of roid rage. First thing, it was bigger overall. It was 10 feet longer and had a larger rear fuselage, vertical tail fin, rudder, and horizontal stabilizer. A stinger was added in the tail with the tail gunner's position. The belly got the Sperry ventral ball turret just after the bomb bay, and the dorsal area got a gun turret too. All this stuff added great gains in weight, 20%, and the turbo supercharged Wright R1820 Cyclone 9 engines were being constantly upgraded to generate more power to keep up. 512E versions were built. The F model was the workhorse of the 8th Air Force in Europe, and they had the nearly frameless pexiglass bombardier's nose for improved forward vision. 3,400 F's were built. Now kids, we need to take a slight detour on our exploration of the B-17 alphabet and look at the YB-40. Yes, it's a whole different number, but it is a B-17 variant. 
1942, the fortress formations were getting their butts kicked by the Luftwaffe, and there were no fighters yet on the horizon that could escort them all the way to the target and back. So the idea was developed to bring along a B-17 with lots of extra guns to help hold off the Luftwaffe. 25 B-17Fs were taken off the production line, and then it looks like they had been exposed to radiation or something in order to sprout tumors of extra guns all over their bodies. They got an extra dorsal turret. A chin turret popped out from under the nose with twin 50s. The waist guns were doubled up to twin mounts, and these positions were staggered to allow for better free movement for the gunners. Because this plane was to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the fighters, extra armor was added, and for all those guns, the ammo had to go somewhere, so the bomb bay was modified as a big ammo dump. I'm surprised that they didn't try to jam an extra ball turret under there, too. Then you could say that the YB-40 really had balls. Okay, sorry. But even without the fantasy extra ball turret, the YB-40 could have 18 or even more 50 caliber machine guns. Anyone see a potential problem with this? Yes, the YB-40 was freaking heavy. It was 4,000 pounds heavier than the planes it was supposed to protect, and thus it took almost twice as long to get to altitude with them, and then had a hard time keeping up with all that weight and drag of all the guns and extra turrets sticking out everywhere. Then, unlike the actual bombers, which would toggle their loads over the target and then get a boost from being lighter on the trip back home, the YB-40 gunships would still be carrying the majority of their ammo and certainly the weight of all the extra guns, armor, and all the other stuff. The YB-40s flew 48 sorties and were accredited with 5 confirmed and 2 probable kills. One YB-40 was shot down, and then the test program was cancelled and the gunships were sent home to be used as trainers. Now, not everything about the YB-40 was a waste. The chin turret from the gunship was incorporated into later versions of the B-17F and all the Gs. The offset waist gun positions were also a great idea, and that was kept too. The tail gunner station with bigger windows for better visibility was also retained and was called the Cheyenne. The B-17G was the final and definitive version of the fortress with a staggering 8,600 of them built. Although this podcast stresses the stories of the aircraft over the stories of the people, I will often have a section that I call pilots. Now this makes more sense with single-engine fighters, let me explain. With a single-engine fighter, the pilot basically puts on the fighter like a armed flying suit of armor and goes out to do battle. The plane and the person become one. He alone aviates, navigates, communicates, and fights, and the machine does his bidding. If either the machine or the pilot fail, the magic link is broken, and both fail. It's very different with the multi-member crews of the bombers. Even if the mission is entirely successful, the experiences of the various members of the crew will necessarily be very different, as they operate more like the individual organs within a larger animal doing very different jobs. Let's do a walkthrough of the B-17 to look at the equipment in the various areas and the crew member assigned to service it. Up in the nose is the bombardier. Arguably, he is the most important member of the crew. It is everybody else's job to get him to a particular piece of sky in front of a target. Within his nose compartment is his Norden bomb site, which is meant to help him get his bombs on the target below. The Norden was the third most expensive weapon system produced in the USA after the B-29 and the atomic bomb. It was the Cadillac of bomb sites. It was made of 2,000 individual parts and was connected directly to the airplane's autopilot. Meaning that over the target, the bombardier would actually be flying the plane via his bomb site. 
Information such as altitude, heading, and airspeed were fed automatically into this mechanical computer, while the bombardier entered such data as the terminal velocity of the bomb, dealt with the wind drift, and identified and selected the target. The site itself was stabilized by gyroscope so that the movements of the plane wouldn't affect the site picture that the bomb aimer was seeing. Later on in the war, B-17s in a formation would all bomb together based on the aiming of the lead plane. And so all the aiming equipment and training became a little bit superfluous as most of the bombardiers became togglers, simply pushing the bomb release button when they saw the lead aircraft drop. For the rest of the mission, the bombardier was a gunner, manning the various guns in the nose. Behind the bombardier was the navigator, who would also man guns as well as continuously plot the course. He had a desk and an astrodome in order to take celestial sightings, which, if you really think about it, is kind of like accessing nature's GPS. Above him was the pilot and co-pilot. Here I'm going to make a slight aside and admit that I'm unsure of another thing. Maybe someone out there has the definitive answer and will let me know where to find it. Why did the U.S. heavies have two pilots and the RAF ones got away with just one? I'm not sure. I've never seen a U.S. quote or policy from on high that said, open quotes, for the guiding of thine iron bird thou shalt have two pilots, close quotes. I've seen a simple numbers argument that the RAF just didn't have enough pilots while the U.S. had enough. I've seen explanations that due to the limited real estate in RAF cockpits, there just wasn't enough space for more controls and an extra body. I also know that the crew taskings were fluid throughout this entire time as the demands of flying, navigating, and managing engines were all changing and the roles needed to change in order to get the workload done. Lastly, I've read that due to the nature of daylight flying in large formations, piloting a U.S. bomber was much, much more tiring, requiring the pilots to swap control every 15 minutes or so to avoid exhaustion. But then again, the RAF bombers started operations during the day, so wouldn't they have a similar tiring problem too, requiring two extra arms? Well, let's put this debate down for now and continue with our B-17 walkthrough. Behind the pilot sat the flight engineer, who was a bit of a jack-of-all-trades. His main job was checking engine operation and fuel consumption and getting the most out of the power plants. But he was also the repairman for anything that broke during the flight, and was also a general helper for the co-pilot, bombardier, and radio man for their duties. Oh yeah, he also managed the dorsal turret. Behind that compartment was the bomb bay, which could be crossed via a quite narrow, think balance beam, wide-looking catwalk between the bomb racks. Next was the radio man station. His job was to keep the liaison and command sets properly tuned and in good working order, and render position reports every 30 minutes. He also had to deal with setting up instrument landing systems and IFF, identify friend or foe. He would also assist the navigator in taking fixes, and he also had a gun in the roof to manage and fire. Behind him was gunner country. The ball turret gunner below was in the most claustrophobic, but ironically, and statistically, the safest position. Hanging below the aircraft, he was just below where the Luftwaffe liked to sweep their streams of bullets and cannon shells. The two waste gunners watched their arcs on the sides while the tail and Charlie watched their six. Gunners were trained to manage their guns, clear stoppages, and be cross-trained on the other guns in order to be able to swap if need be. So I knew when starting this one that it was going to be a multi-parter. How could it not be with such a rich topic? So now that we've designed, tested, prototyped, competed and crawled through a B-17, in our next episode, it will be time to take it to war. Thanks again to all who support the podcast through Patreon. I appreciate it more than you know. You can also check out some photos of what we've been talking about on the Patreon page. 
These are available to all, and please check out the kit shop. You don't even have to buy anything. Just by clicking on the link, you help out the podcast. Until next time.